me that I didn't have my mic on. And I was like, oh, I got it, honey. <laughs> Sorry. Good to be together. Silver Creek Church, welcome to those of you who are watching us online. Great to have you join us that way. I know uh, there are illnesses and stuff going around, so it's good that we're able to have you join us even if you're staying at home. Um, if you happen to be new to us this morning, I also just want to say a special warm welcome to you. We feel honored that you would spend some time with us today. would love the chance to meet you. My name's Todd, if I haven't met you already. All right, so before I get into the sermon this morning, uh, what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of an update. Pastor Dan already said that we're going to be sending out a Christmas message. Uh, for, it'll be on video for you on Christmas Day. I just wanted to tell you, I put that message together. It's designed for you to actually gather your family right before you open gifts on Christmas Day, if possible. If not, if you can't hold the kids off, maybe after the gifts. But it's designed to kind of keep your priorities in the right place, to understand the greatest gift of Christmas. And if you have extended family that are coming around, it could also be a great opportunity uh, to let everyone know uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the real meaning of Christmas. So that video will be available through email, through social media. Uh, it'll be posted on our website. It should be difficult for you to not find it. That's we want to make it easy uh, for you. All right. So with that said, we're going to continue our series this morning that we have called a planned interruption. It's scenes from the Christmas story. And the reason it's called a planned interruption is because what, what we see in the scenes of the Christmas story is God continually interrupting different characters' lives, different characters' plans, in order to fulfill His plan in their lives, even if it means a major disruption or interruption. One of the things that we've been saying over the last few weeks is we hope that you guys all will start to see ways, even today, that God may be interrupting your life, your plans, in order to fulfill His plan in your life, His greater plan, even though sometimes it's challenging. And so, let me review a little bit. First week, we talked about, uh, Dom actually talked about Joseph and how God interrupted Joseph's life. Then we talked about God interrupted Mary's life, and then the wise men. And today, we're going to talk about the shepherds, the shepherds, the last characters that we're going to focus on. Now, uh, if you remember last week, one of the things I said about the wise men is that the wise men came a long way, hundreds of miles over the course of a bunch of months to try to get all the way to Jesus. On the contrary, the shepherds weren't even looking for Jesus. Right? Jesus came looking for them. I think if there's anything that I would want you to know, if you miss everything in this series, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. It's that the story of Christmas is not a story about you looking for God. It's a story about God who came looking for you. Right? That's the story of Christmas. That's the story of the gospel. And I hope you see that even today. All right, so the Shoopings did a great job of reading Luke chapter 2, 8 to 20. That's where we're going to be this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 2. I'm not going to read the whole thing because they already read it. But I will give you my three questions that will kind of act as our outline for today. And here they are. Who are the shepherds? Number one, who were they? Let's get to know them a little bit. Second thing is, why were they afraid? Right. Third thing is, why, how did they get rid of the fear? So who are the shepherds? Why were they afraid? And how did they get rid of the fear that they had? All right, let's start in first. Who were the shepherds? All right, Luke 2, verses 8 and 9 says this. And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. All right, let's set the scene once again. I've got my nativity right here. I know it's far away, so we'll put a picture up there of it, All right? And if you remember what I said last week, we talked about the wise men. The wise men should not be in your nativity scene. Right? If they are, you should, you should take them and put them on the opposite side of the house because it took them a long time to get from the east to come all the way to see baby Jesus. And he was probably at least three, if not a year old, three months, if not a year old at that time. 
Right, so my wise men in the back, go ahead and stand up. All right, we got some new wise men this time. Well done. All right, give them a round of applause. All right. This, thank you. This is the scale, right? I, I had them stand because that's the scale on the day or the night Jesus was born. On the contrary, the shepherds is a much different story because the shepherds were actually, it says, in the same region watching their flocks on the very night that Jesus was born. So this is a much different thing. So my shepherds are right here. I pulled my family into it. Good job. You can have a seat. They're the only ones that will sit in the front row because I have to. So, um, sorry. But those are the shepherds. Now, the shepherds um, were, like I said, they were right near where, this, in the same region, on the same night that Jesus was born. It begs the question, here's one of the questions that I have. Right? The shepherds ended up being the first people outside of Joseph and Mary to actually lay eyes, lay eyes on baby Jesus. Why? Like, why would God choose shepherds to be the first people to see baby Jesus? Well, let me, let me talk to you first of all. I love the Christmas story because um, there, are, there are two groups of people. Last week we talked about the wise men. This week we talk about the shepherds. There couldn't be any more different types of people than the wise men and the shepherds. If you were here last week, where the wise men were like upper class, you know, really educated people, had made a high income. That's why they brought uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are expensive gifts. So the wise men were these upper class, sophisticated individuals that were highly educated. On the contrary, you have the shepherds who were actually pretty low class people. They were more common people, kind of blue collar workers. They worked hard. And actually, some scholars say that the shepherds were socially not all that acceptable. They were kind of on the outs socially, not trustworthy, whether it was true or not. They didn't have a good reputation. They weren't the kind of people that you wanted your kids to hang around. That was, the, that was what we know about the shepherds. And so you see this massive difference between the shepherds and the wise men. Let me stop there for a second and say this. Many people will say this about Christianity. You know, I don't like Christianity because it's like one of the most exclusive religions. Like it, it, it feels like it's only for certain people. Here's what I want you to know. Have you ever talked to somebody that says, uh, you know, I'm really not the church going type. Okay. <laughs> Those kind of people. Listen, the shepherds were not the church-going type. Right? Kind of one of the points of this whole story. Right? The story of the wise men and the shepherds and the fact that both of them are the, some of the first characters to be a part of the birth of Jesus tells you something. Christianity is actually one of the most inclusive religions around. Right? That, Jesus, that God sent Jesus at Christmas for both wise men and shepherds. Right? For the poor and the rich. God came for the black and the white. Republicans, Democrats, naughty, nice. Right? And it pains me to say this, but both Browns fans and Steelers fans. And we're going to add in Ravens fans, even, since that's so fresh. Got the W. All right. Listen, the passage goes on in verse 10 and says this. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For all the people. This is so simple, but I think it's so important for us to understand that it says all the people. I think one of the reasons, one of the things that's so easy to do is to, to feel like because of what you've done or who you are, like you feel like you're a shepherd, like you're rough around the edges. You, you know, you're maybe on the outs. You're not trustworthy, whatever. But it's easy to feel like maybe Jesus didn't really come for you based on what you've done, based on who you are, right? But that's not what it says. It says that Jesus came for all the people. Not only did he come for you, whoever you are, Whatever you've done, however riddled your past is, he also came for the person that is the exact opposite of you, whoever that is. He came for 
all people. And I think that's really important for us. So one of the prayers that I'm praying for you and for me over Christmas is that this would really hit us. Not only would we be able to see ourselves as people with whom Jesus came for, but that we would be able to see the people that are opposite of us as people whom Jesus came for. That person, think of the person in your mind right now that is so hard for you, right? The colleague or the, the neighbor or whoever. Who is that person who's so hard for you to, to love? So difficult. Jesus came for that person. Right? And we need to have minds and hearts that are willing to see as Jesus sees. And that's what we see in the contrast between the wise men and the shepherds. That, that's what we see in this story. All right, so that leads me to the second question. Is not only who were the shepherds, but why were they afraid? Why were they afraid? All right. Verse 9 says this. And in the same region... Sorry, let me go to verse 9. And the, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. They were filled with great fear. Now, when it says great fear, the, the word, if you look at the original Greek of this passage, the word fear is actually translated, it's phobio. And phobio is where we get the word phobia, which we know is, you know, a fear. But it doesn't just say phobio. The translation is phobio phobos which basically means afraid, afraid, or fear, fear. It's like saying fear twice for emphasis on how frightening it actually was. But in the English, we would never translate it that way, so they translated in this one, great fear. The point is this. This wasn't the kind of fear where, like, you see a spider and you're like, ah, a spider. This is like, frightening, debilitating, fall on your face and hide yourself kind of fear that the shepherds experienced on that night when the angels showed up. Now, there were obvious reasons why they experienced fear. I mean, if you're out in the field keeping watch over your flocks and it's dark and, you know, not much is going on and then all of a sudden an angel, but not just an angel, a multitude of angels shows up singing over you, hovering in the air, that's pretty scary. That's pretty wild. But there's another reason why they were afraid. And it's in this passage. You can't miss it. You got to see it. Verse 9 says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. What you see here is what gave them the most fear was not just that it was like this crazy angel situation. I'm sure that was part of it. But it says the glory of the Lord shone around them. What made them afraid was the glory of God was in their presence. And something you need to know about the glory of God, even throughout Scripture, is that the glory of God is one of the most frightening things to come face to face with. But it was never actually supposed to be that way. And you wonder, why is the glory of God so frightening? Well, to understand this, we got to go back to the beginning. We got to go back to how this all started. So you, you probably know the story, but you know, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them to have a relationship with God that would fulfill them and give them all the security and peace and love and joy they needed. Right? So being perfectly connected to God was where they got their source of life. That means they walked around and they had the glory of God and the presence of God all the time. And it was perfect. It gave them security. It gave them peace. It gave them love. It gave them everything we need. Adam and Eve weren't walking around going, oh, man, I wonder if there's something else that I need. They didn't need a thing because they had the glory of God. So what happened? Well, what happened is Satan came and convinced Adam and Eve that actually they might, there might be more that God is keeping from them. Right? There's more that they could have. Like, Having a relationship with God as your source isn't enough. And so what did Adam and Eve do? They, they ate of the only tree that God told them not to eat of. And ever since that point, all hell kind of broke loose. Right? Something crazy happened, and I want to read that to you. It is uh, Genesis 3. I'm going to read the story. Verses 8 to 10. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. What happened was this. For the very first time, instead of the glory and the presence of God bringing security and peace and joy and fulfillment, it brought complete frightening fear. Why? Because for the first time they were disconnected because of their sin from the only source of life that could give them that kind of security. And it was frightening. Suddenly, they understood just how unworthy they were to be in the presence of the glory of God. Now, um, there's not a perfect illustration for this, but I heard one by Tim Keller, who's a pastor that I really like, so I'm going to steal it. And uh, this is what Tim Keller, but if, you, you know, if you'd say it's his, then it's not stealing. Um, so Tim Keller said this. He, he said it's kind of like if you were to impersonate a police officer. And I, I know in our church we have a few different police officers, so this might resonate a little bit, but if you decided you were going to you know, impersonate a police officer, obviously that's really bad. But you would, you'd put on a uniform, you'd get in the cruiser, you'd have all the equipment, and you would look exactly like a police officer. You'd be driving around, and everything would be going fine. That is, until you're caught by the real cops. And once you are caught by the real cops, you are done for, right? You don't stand a chance when you get found out. And I think what you see is, what you see in this illustration is the original sin of Adam and Eve is exactly like this. What they are doing is they are playing the part of God. It wasn't that they ate a piece of fruit from a tree. It's that they thought they knew better than God. It's that they thought, I'm in charge of my life. Like, I can do what I want, and I know better than God. They played the role of God, and it worked for a second until they came face to face with the real glory of God and it wrecked them. And they were done for and they couldn't stand a chance against the glory of God. I want you to know that every sin from that point on, every sin that you and I experience and commit in this life is a result of us playing the part of God. Thinking that we know better than God, that we're in charge. And it might work for a little while. But when we come face to face with the glory of God, we will become ever aware that we don't stand a chance against God's glory. And that's what we see in this story. Fast forward to the shepherds. The shepherds on the night when the angels came were frightened out of their minds because when the glory of God shines on you, Suddenly, you are well aware of every sin and every wrong thing that you have ever done. And it is frightening. It is exposing. And that's exactly what happened with the shepherds that night. Um, what, what you see in the shepherds is that they suddenly realized just how unworthy they were of the glory of God. And it wrecked them. Right? That's the fear that you, that's why it was not just the fear like you saw a spider. That's why it was fear, fear. That's why it was afraid, afraid. Because they came face to face with God, the real God. And they knew they didn't stand a chance. All right. So that's what you see. Now listen, I, uh, we are in a culture right now, in a time right now, where fear and anxiety is at an all-time high level. I mean, you have all talk to somebody this week that's struggling with anxiety or fear in some way, most likely. I feel like I do all the time talk to people who are really debilitated by fear of something. And I think that, um, you know, first of all, let me say this, that if you struggle with debilitating anxiety, I really think that you, you should see a counselor because they're skilled to help you understand, you know, what you need to do and how to cope and everything like that. But I think, so I don't mean to oversimplify this, but I think most of fear and anxiety comes from this. We all kind of inside of us have this fear of rejection. 
We have this fear that we just somehow don't measure up, that we're not good enough. Not good enough for the standards of other people, not good enough for the standards that we put on ourselves. And what happens is like the more successful you are, almost the worse it can be. Because if you're successful, what you've done is you've been so anxious that you've, you've gotten to be successful. And what happens is you get to that point and you still feel like it's not enough. You still feel like somehow you don't measure up no matter how good you are, no matter how many goals that you've reached in your life, you feel like you don't measure up. I think that's, that's inside every single one of us. The reason traces all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Because of our sin, we are disconnected from the very source of life we were made for, God himself. That means every single one of us fall well short of the standard that God has created us for. That's why Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I believe the root of so much fear and anxiety is that every single one of us falls well short of the glory that we were made to have in a relationship with God. So you want to know why you feel like you don't measure up sometimes, why you feel like there's always this feeling like you're not good enough, like you can't perform well enough, and even when you do finally get what you thought was going to be enough, it still isn't enough. And here's why. Because that's absolutely 100% true of you. You're not enough. I'm not enough. Right? When it come, because we were created for God's glorious standard. And so every single one of us falls short of that standard. We are left wanting to be enough, but we will never be enough on our own. And a story of the shepherds, right? If it ended with debilitating fear, It would be horrible if your story ends there with debilitating fear. It only leads you to anxiety and depression and despair. But here's what I want you to know. The story of the shepherds doesn't end there, and neither does yours. Neither does yours. You don't have to have it end there. And that leads me to the last point. Last question is this. How did they get rid of fear? How did they get rid of fear? Look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Notice uh, the angel doesn't say, Fear not, you're not as bad as you think you are. That's not what, that's not what the angel says. The angel's assuming, like, the reason you're on the ground in fear is because, yeah, the glory of God will wreck you. You don't measure up at all compared to God's glory. But that's not what he says. He says, Fear not. I bring you good news. Good news. Um, Let me let me go back and tell you a little little bit of a story. So when I, uh, as a pastor, whenever I meet somebody and they don't know that I'm a pastor, something always happens. Like if I spend some time with them and uh, we hang out a little bit, and then at, at the end of our time together, they they find out that I am a pastor. They will. This happens to me all the time. They'll be like oh, you're a pastor. I am so sorry. I was using some really bad language, you know, and like, I I can't believe like some of the things that I've done and said in this conversation. And here you're a pastor. I feel like God is going to strike me dead, you know, and it's such a weird thing why people would connect me as a pastor with God watching them as if I need to be there for God to watch them, right, or to see them. But I think, it's, I think this is actually true of every single one of us. When we come face to face, not with a pastor, but with the glory of God, we suddenly are aware of every single sin and everything we have done, and we are face to face with the glory of God, and we know we don't stand a chance because of our sin. And that's what we see. The shepherds that night felt like what was about to happen most likely was that lightning was going to strike them dead. But instead of lightning what they got was something so much better, something that was beyond their wildest dreams. What they got was good news. What they got was good news. The good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Actually, gospel means good news. And uh, here at this church, 
we preach the gospel all the time. Actually, one of our, uh, one of our motives, we have six motives or values that we kind of hold that keep us aligned, moving towards the vision we feel like God gave us. And the number one value that we have is keep Jesus central. Because what we believe is that if you want the best news of all time, it only comes through the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That is where the best news is found. And so let's take a look at that news. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The good news is that God has given us a savior. And what I want to point out about that is that God did not give us Jesus to be an assistant or an aid or a helper or a support person. What God gave us in Jesus was a savior. And the only reason that he would give us Jesus as a savior is if we needed saving. Right? If the only reason that you would actually take Jesus as your savior is if you felt like you needed saving. If you're here today and you don't think you need saving, you will never come to Jesus. But one of the things I want to tell you is I think that's one of the ways God interrupts our lives and shows us his plan, is that oftentimes we like to play God. Maybe you resonated with that before we talked about playing God. We like to play God. We like to do things our way. We want to be in charge of our lives until... We are painfully aware that the way we're doing things just is not working. And sometimes what God will use in that is a marriage that begins to be broken or, or some sort of hardship in your life or loss or a diagnosis. And all of a sudden, you are painfully aware that you are in less control of your life than you thought you were. That's, that's what happens in this. Now, what they got was good news. And the good news was this. Oh, and by the way, none of us measure up to God's glory. All of us fall short. And so in our sin, if we approach God, we are done for. None of us measures up. And if that's going to end there, what happens is it leads to fear and anxiety and despair, unless God chose to do something about it. And that's what makes the Christmas story so unbelievably beautiful, is that he sent Jesus to be our Savior. That means he died in your place for your sins so that you could be reconnected back to the only source of life that you were made for. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is a mind-blowing verse if you understand what it means. And I want to read it to you. It says this, For our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin." Who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what this verse is saying Jesus went to the cross, was born in this world, went to the cross, and what he did on the cross is he took our record of sin. Everything, when the glory of God hits you, that you're painfully aware of that you've done wrong in your life in the past. At the cross, Jesus took all of those things on himself. He took all your record of sin on him. And what he did is called the great exchange. In exchange, he gave you his righteousness, his perfect record of righteousness. So that here's what happens when God looks down on you. When you come face to face with the glory of God now, what happens is he doesn't see your sin anymore. If you have come to know Jesus as your Savior, he looks down on you and he doesn't see sin. He doesn't see all the record of bad. What he sees is Jesus. And it's really mind-blowing. That kind of grace changes everything. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing in this passage. Listen, without Jesus, your worst fear will become a reality. Because you come face to face with the glory of God and you'll be crushed. With Jesus, your worst fear has actually become his reality so that you will never have to be afraid again. You will never play God again. And that's what we see right here in this passage. Luke 2, back to this, verses 15 and 16. It says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Right? They went with haste. So what happened? Notice they didn't have the angels go away and just go, oh, that was awkward. Let's kind of go on and do the rest of our night and then go home and what's done is done. No, the angel, what the angels said completely changed everything. Shepherding didn't matter anymore. That's not who they were. That's not where they found their identity. So they left it all behind and they made haste to go find baby Jesus. So my, my shepherds, make haste. Come on, quick. Quick, you gotta go faster. All right. Oh no, you dropped it. All right. Good. They came all the way and they found baby Jesus and it changed everything for us, for them. And I, it can change everything for you, too. I think when you understand this good news of the gospel that I just shared, you, you leave your old identity behind. Like, you run headlong into the arms of Jesus because he is all that you need in order to get back to your very source of life that you were created for. And so I guess my question is for you today is, have you found Jesus? Have you understood the gospel in such a way that you have given your life, placed your faith in what Jesus has done? And if you haven't, maybe today would be the day that you give your life over to Jesus and know that you can approach the glory. You can come face to face with the glory of God and not be crushed because actually God sent Jesus to be crushed on your behalf so that you never have to be crushed again. And there's so much freedom in that. Here's what happened with the shepherds in verse 20. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. All right. They went away, and they were different people. What started as a story of debilitating fear ended with praising God and glorifying God the whole way back. The story is amazing. Listen, I, I want you to know if you struggle with fear, debilitating anxiety, what I want you to know is this. Your story doesn't have to end there because what Jesus has done for you gives you a chance to be reconnected to the source of life, the source of love. And the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And here's what I, I the last thing I'll tell you is this. If you are um, a follower of Jesus today, I want to remind you of something that Jesus didn't just come uh, down to die for you so that he could be near to you. He came down to give his life for you so that he, so that God would live inside of you. It's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and begins to change you from the inside out. So I want you to know the glory of God isn't in this place because this is a church. The glory of God is in this place because it lives inside of every believer that is in here right now. And that is powerful. And so as we close, let us worship. And as we worship, let it melt away the fear and the anxiety because we know that Jesus paid for it all on our behalf. Father, you are so good. We thank you for being a God who has given us a Savior. We need a Savior so badly. And I think some maybe today are more aware of that than others, but wherever people are at today, would you meet them with your saving grace and your saving power? I pray that, Lord, there might be some in here who for the first time give their lives to Jesus because of what they heard today. Just like the shepherds, Lord, I pray that they would be struck by what you've done. Lord, I ask today that all of us would grow closer to you. Now we'd worship you for who you are. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>